I might be biased, but I think reptiles make pretty cool pets. And more and more people are starting to agree with that. With this rise in popularity, new keepers are met with the whole internet of information on their new pet. But this wealth of knowledge comes with conflicting information and confusing advice. And this is a huge problem. Captive animals are expected to live longer than their wild counterparts, yet exotic pets commonly die prematurely. 75% of pet reptiles die within their first year of being purchased, and over 70% of reptile illnesses in captivity are due to poor husbandry, at least partially due to poor care practices perpetuated through online resources. I've been keeping pet reptiles for over 10 years since I was... wee small. So I've seen the evolution of reptile care online. Now that I'm older, with more experience, and a bachelor's degree in zoology, I really just want to make that experience a lot easier for people getting into the reptile hobby. If you've ever looked into getting a reptile, you're well aware of the beginner pet phenomenon. Google has lists upon lists of what reptile you should get as your first scaly friend. And they always have the classics, bearded dragons, leopard geckos, ball pythons, and corn snakes. If you've looked at these lists, I don't blame you. I think we all have. I know when I first started getting into reptile keeping, I really gravitated towards beginner reptiles because I wanted to ensure that I could provide the animal their best life possible. I think it's very responsible of us to acknowledge our own abilities and knowledge or lack thereof and choose an experience to your level. But it also comes at a cost because this beginner label is often interpreted as this animal doesn't need as much attention or care. Many of these starter reptiles can simply withstand being in poor conditions for long periods of time, but this forgiveness or hardiness doesn't mean we should be keeping them in worse conditions than their advanced counterparts. Despite study after study on why we shouldn't label animals this way, I don't think this system is going anywhere anytime soon, but why? Like the root of many of our problems, capitalism is a big answer to this question. In any chain pet store, this label is printed directly on the price tag, which to me seems like more of a marketing strategy than really putting the animal's needs first. These animals are also usually the ones that are most in supply and the cheapest. I think it's also partially the reason that reptile expos are slowly becoming a sea of leopard geckos and ball pythons. Beginner reptiles are the most bought and therefore the most bred and their easy care makes it really easy for money-hungry people to breed them without really considering the animal or having passion for the actual project. It's really just an easy way to make money. A study in the journal Frontiers in Animal Science stated that reptile expos are known to be associated with poor knowledge among exhibitors and sellers of animals, misleading education, poor husbandry, and encouragement of impulse purchases. This video is not a criticism of reptile expos as a whole. I have supported reptile expos in the past and I will likely support them in the future. I think they're an accessible way to support reputable breeders, but we do have to keep in mind that expos are not screaming for breeders with morals. Not every breeder at an expo is going to be a good person. And there are faults with reptile expos that I think we should be knowledgeable about. When I go to reptile expos, I go with purpose, I go with reason. I'll only buy an animal if I had planned to buy that animal prior to going to the event, if I had already done research, had an enclosure set up for it, known which breeder I'm going to buy from, and I'm just fully prepared for the animal's arrival. However, thousands of people attend reptile expos every year, and not everybody has that same strategy and money-hungry sellers are taking advantage of those people. Marketing animals as easy or for beginners gives shady breeders just one more advantage to make more money regardless of the future or well-being of the animals that they're selling. It also allows pet stores to market their products towards these stereotypes associated with beginner reptiles. One of the most obvious are these reptile kits with outdated recommended supplies. The most unfortunate example I can think of are these bearded dragon kits containing a 20 gallon enclosure, calcium sand, and food pellets with an adult bearded dragon image on the side. A bearded dragon would grow out of this in less than a year and would require a 4x2x2 foot enclosure as an adult. If pet stores and breeders were honest about the care requirements of the animals that they sell, they would miss out on a huge portion of sales from impulse purchases. Research showed that in 2019, 43% of first-time exotic pet owners 
purchased their animals on impulse. So instead, they perpetuate poor standards to put more money in their pockets. These poor standards have been increasingly being referred to as folklore husbandry, which is a term coined by Kevin Arbuckle, who describes it as methods or supposed best practices, which became established without proper valuation, often justified because it has always been done that way. Basically, just doing things by tradition or uncritically accepting anecdotal husbandry practices. If you've spent any time on herpticulture social media, it does not take long to find some typically middle-aged white man in the comments of someone, typically a naturalistic keeper, telling them that they're doing too much or that they've been keeping this species for X amount of years and they clearly know what's best. <clears throat> Obviously other people perpetuate poor husbandry standards as well, but it's unsurprising that the people who are loudest about it and least likely to take constructive criticism are also the breeders that we talked about in the last section. So how are beginners getting impacted by this folklore husbandry? Well, care sheets are often the primary source of information for new keepers, and we have to remember that care sheets can be written by anybody and still look official and reputable. But if these care guides aren't citing scientific information at the bare minimum of the animal ecology or natural history, then I think we should be questioning them. Even care guides written by pet stores, which a lot of people trust. And when I was a kid, I used to collect those little brochures. They were my personal Bible. I had a binder full of them. But they are so full of misinformation and they just perpetuate folklore husbandry. Slight side note, as I was looking for examples of care guides from pet stores, I found this care guide article on the PetSmart website with an AI-generated image of a snake as the header and just the worst information possible. It said that the snake's enclosure should be two-thirds the size of the snake. So the snake can't even stretch out fully. Okay. I'm just so sad. Arbuckle also argues that the perpetuation of folklore husbandry can be due to a lack of information overall, since we do need more research being done on reptiles as a whole. The belief that experience is better than research, or a lack of encouragement or perceived ability to pursue a new way of keeping. Although published husbandry reports and peer-reviewed research articles exist for many species, they can be hard to find or interpret, and it's not fair to expect someone to be a scientist or have experience in reading scientific literature just because they want a corn snake. So these hobbyist contributions continue to dominate the information. Shifting a little bit, I also think ego is just a huge problem in the reptile hobby, but I also don't think all of the ego is rooted in evil. I've obviously already talked about some of the evil forces underlying the problems I've noticed in the hobby. However, I do think most keepers have good intentions. Beginner reptile keepers can take all of the right steps of researching an animal before they purchase it, but because folklore husbandry overtakes online resources, it totally skews the perception of their own care. A recent study published in 2021 titled Pet Reptiles, Are We Meeting Their Needs? surveyed 220 reptile keepers to self-report on their own knowledge of reptile behavior and their husbandry. 85% of keepers surveyed failed to provide at least one of the four husbandry needs of temperature, lighting, diet, or refuge. Yet only one of the respondents reported their animal husbandry as poor. Majority of them, 68%, scored their care as very good. This paper goes in to describe this as keeping animals in controlled deprivation at best, which I don't think is most people's goal when they keep reptiles. And I do not blame intro herb keepers for making mistakes because they're following what they have been taught. Most of the participants that failed to provide one of those resources was typically lacking UV light, which is so heavily debated in herb culture that I don't blame intro keepers for not knowing what to do. I've made many mistakes in my pet keeping journey. My poor first ever pet, my pet bearded dragon when I was a kid, I feel so bad because I was young and learning my way through it. And he was kept on calcium sand before we knew that calcium sand was horrible because we were all told that calcium was safe because if they eat it, it's made out of calcium so they can't get impaction. There was a heat rock in his enclosure at one point in time. 
it's, it's so clear to me why that would be unsafe now, but at the time, it was what was recommended. And those mistakes haunt me, and I never intended to do something that would negatively affect my bearded dragon, in which I loved so much. And I believe most people have good intentions. And other people are exploring people's motivations for keeping pet reptiles validates my goodwill suspicions. Most participants were keeping reptiles for emotional reasons, which they described as admiration, love, fascination, passion, etc. So I really do think most people love their pet reptiles. Yet inadequate care has been so normalized through folklore husbandry, it has shifted the way people see their own care. People naturally want to believe in the good, we want to believe that people are telling us the truth, we want to believe that our good intentions could never backfire on us. So then when someone tells us that the care that we've been providing out of love is actually harmful, I think it's natural for a lot of people to resist that new information. Because you know you never meant to hurt something you love. And honestly, these care standards are so deeply rooted in the hatred and disdain for these animals that they're unintelligent, or that they are somehow evil and therefore don't deserve our love or kindness or empathy. Even though keepers shouldn't be sharing those same thoughts and feelings, they're so deeply ingrained in how the world believes reptiles should be treated that it just maintains the view of them as products or toys or as disposable. This established negative perception of reptiles also desensitizes us to their suffering over generations and generations of basically only seeing reptiles in distressed contexts. In Pet Reptiles Are We Meeting Their Needs, the authors go on to say that many of the study's participants were not able to distinguish between stress-related behaviors and normal ones. And I understand that it can be difficult. Being a pet keeper means you're basically learning the language of a different species and interpreting it into something that we can empathize with and that we can understand. I acknowledge that this isn't black and white, and this issue goes well beyond herps. I've seen many dog keepers, dog keepers? Dog owners, unable to recognize when their dogs are unhappy. I live in a coastal community where sea lions are currently being really heavily affected by domoic acid from algae blooms, which is a neurotoxin that causes seizures, and people will see the sea lions having seizures and think they're just being silly or playing or having fun when they are in utter agony. Reptiles especially are notorious for showing very slight behavioral differences or signs that they're sick or unwell as a defense mechanism. It's something we really have to put effort in to learn when they're under our care. And if we don't offer the resources to teach it, then it's unfair to think that it'll just change on its own. So how are things going to change? I want to start by saying I do have hope for good change. I don't want you to leave this video thinking everything's doomed and everyone's accidentally abusing their animals and feeling guilt that you've made mistakes that have been mentioned in this video. That's not the goal. The issue has always been we have to work with imperfect knowledge. Unfortunately, in the priorities of scientific research, herbs don't get much attention, so we can't wait till we have all of the information available to us to start making change. Because we have animals in our care right now that have to be taken care of. There's also no single correct way of taking care of different species. I'm obviously biased to bioactive enclosures, but I think sterile setups have a time and a place and are important to have knowledge about. Slight variety in how we care for our different species is really important as we continue to advance husbandry and learn about the care of these species. Care has to be constantly evolving, and keepers have to be open to change, something that we have a problem with in the hobby where ego and convenience overpowers the motivation to make change. But evidence-based husbandry is on the rise. I'd argue it's almost trendy right now, but I mean that in the best way possible. So many creators that I follow or I'm mutuals with set such great examples for evidence-based husbandry and inspire new keepers to do the same. I'm such a fan of evidence-based husbandry because it uses knowledge of the species, natural history from both field-based observations and studies within captivity to really drive herpticulture. However, due to the lack of care guides prioritizing this type of research, the responsibility for people implementing this type of care falls onto the individual keepers. Finding information, interpreting that information, understanding what's important within that information, and organizing the information into something usable is 
really overwhelming for keepers and it can cause them to believe that they're not equipped to make the switch. Which means there's a lot we need to do within the hobby before we can start expecting beginners to implement these strategies. And that's not to say that beginners don't already implement these strategies or they haven't found this type of information elsewhere, especially with the rise of such great keepers online, but I just think it's an issue that will take a while to do a full 180 because it's all just so ingrained in our hobby and the society we live in because we do, in fact, live in one. However, if you do want to take action now, I really like this protocol proposed by Lofman in a 2020 article on evidence-based husbandry based on natural history questions developed by Bartholomew in 1986. Lofman proposes that we can obtain science-backed standards for a species by asking five questions. What species is it? Where does the species live? How does the species survive? How did the species end up here? And what is the species life history? He lays out how each question can be translated into captivity with these two tables. Feel free to screenshot these charts that provide in depth each of the questions and how they are used. To use this protocol, Lofman recommended ways to find sources like searching keywords and phrases like the ecology of your species, behavioral ecology of your species, diet of your species, etc, etc, and using field guides to understand their species distribution. He also goes into a detailed example of how to use this protocol, where he basically fills in the list of table 2 for false water cobras. He implements the routine and compares it to the typical care guide for the same species, and he found that the evidence-based approach did increase the snake's welfare. And that all might seem really overwhelming or too much work, huge tables from scientific literature, that sounds a whole lot like homework, yuck. But I believe if we're going to be keeping animals in captivity for our own benefit, or dare I say selfishness, the least we can do is provide them a life worth living beyond controlled deprivation. My criticism lies more in the hobby itself than the individuals using the tools that are available to them, and I hope that there is a continued shift in care guides and resources to use Lofman's proposed protocol. If you are just starting to get into reptiles, and this all sounds very scary, I've linked some of my favorite sources to get care information for reptiles in the description, including Reptifiles, which is generally the most up-to-date and reliable. But I hope this inspires you to at least question the care that we've been desensitized to and have normalized over the years and generations of keeping pet reptiles because these animals have no choice but to trust us that we will give them the care and the respect that they deserve. This video is very different than what I've posted in the past, but I have always been very interested in making video essays, so if you enjoyed any parts of this, I have a lot of other topics I'd be willing to talk too much about, but if you didn't like this, I have bioactive builds planned for this summer, and lots of other things, so feel free to stick around either way, and thanks for watching!